Israeli innovation journey actually starts before statehood, when Jewish people had a lot of history, but very, very little geography. On May 14, 1948, the State of Israel was born, a small country with very little resources and a very wounded population of immigrants from around the world who flocked to Israel with the purpose of rebuilding the Jewish land. 2021, the State of Israel is only 73 years old. The population has just crossed the 9 million mark. But despite being very young and relatively small, paradoxically, the country is responsible for a non-proportional part in the global innovation ecosystem. What was it in Israel's journey that led the country to this position? Were there any other options? I think our journey really comes from necessities. That necessity drives you to use your brain power to compensate for everything that you lack. Either it's food or water or energy or defense or economy or peace. You need to use your brain power to achieve those. For thousands of years, Jewish people were immigrants. And immigrants uh, are entrepreneurs by definition because they come somewhere new where they have nothing and they have to build their life, build their, they have to create practically everything from zero. When you now talk about innovation, it's about the creation of the country. That was an innovative step. I mean, to create a country from zero to something, and you needed some innovation. But I don't, I'm, I'm almost sure that those people who started Israel never thought of it as a startup project or an innovation project. It was a survival project, and uh, it was a, an amazing survival project. can identify five steps of innovation. The first one starts with Herzl, when Herzl had a vision to uh, create a nation, a state, for the Jewish people. And the first part of innovation was what kind of a culture, what kind of a society we want. One of the key conditions for open innovation is diversity. You need different people from different places, from different approaches. Israel is probably the home of diversity because when Israel was founded, we had many immigrants come from all over the world. A good entrepreneur is one that jumps without a parachute and builds the parachute while falling. And the reason he's capable of doing this, he has no other choice. I think this is what's so unique about Israel. In 48, we started, we knew we have no choice. It's either life or innovation. We have to be more innovative and we have to fight to make it work. And I think this is the spirit that eventually drives a lot of the innovation here. We have something quite unique that everyone are born with. We call it chutzpah. So chutzpah is a combination of many things, probably audacity and when you have a crazy idea, you go after it, even if it's crazy. And once you fail, you try again. And we don't study this at school. This is something we are born with. The third step uh, for me is all about security and defense, building our defense industry. Since we have nothing that can protect us naturally, no mountains or valleys or oceans or stormy weather, we had to create a defense shield that, that is made of brain power. If you want to achieve long-term sustainability, you have to achieve peace. If you have to achieve peace, you have to have deterrence. So his ultimate goal was to bring Israel to an age of peace. In order to do that, you needed to have strong defense industry. Its path was as follows. The young state's need for a strong army and protection from its neighbors led it to develop entirely security-focused industries. This required a lot of initiative, audacity, and innovation. The nuclear reactor was built, satellites were developed and successfully launched for security and communication, cybersecurity was developed to the highest level. Projects such as the Arrow, the Lavi, and of course the Iron Dome changed the face of the country. The fourth step in our journey is the economic one, which started in the economic collapse 
or the implosion in 1984 when our inflation rate rose to about 450%. And the whole economy was collapsing. And out of that, the Israeli capitalism or the venture capital or the startup nation really started to be created with global enterprises coming to Israel. We were a few individuals playing the high-tech game in the early 90s. Early 90s, I mean, uh, innovation and st startups and exits, that was not the culture at all. I mean, there was maybe one, early 90s, maybe there was one venture capitalist fund, semi-governmental, and a few crazy players who played the game. We came here with uh, quite a small land, arid uh, environment and hostile environment, and we needed to uh, basically serve ourselves. Israel is, quite, is an island. It's not geographically an island, but doesn't, it's an island uh, de facto. Or, uh, uh, so many of the things we developed because of necessity. But this created quite a substantial impact. First of all, it enabled life and prosperous life in Israel. Second, it uh, created a mindset of uh, innovation that we can do it ourselves. One of the great advantages of Israel is the economy of small scale. We're a small country, geographically, population-wise, but we're very diverse very close by geographically. People know each other, and those who don't know each other know the people who do know each other, and this network of knowledge, languages, um, research areas, in initiatives areas, startup areas, when they converge, we can create change much, much quicker. And when you have such a small country, you, and you don't innovate for your own needs, because your market does not exist, the market is global, then you create a global interest in what you do. So whatever Israel does is not only for itself, even if it's agriculture or water or energy or cybersecurity or mobility, anything is actually um, can be implemented on a global basis. And so we suffered from on one hand, from not having a market, on the other hand, it was a bless. Because you cannot innovate for little things. What you innovate is on a global scale. And it attracted investors, it attracted global enterprises, it attracted a lot of interest in what we do here. Uh, this was created also by uh, government policy at the time, in the early 90s, that basically the government took risk and developed the Israeli venture capital industry, and today it's a, it's, a, it's a substantial industry that is also very important in this ecosystem. We have a budget of an annual budget of about around 600 million US dollars that we annually allocate to the Israeli industry. We provide grants to single entrepreneurs, we provide grants to transfer of knowledge from academia to industry, and we provide grants to companies all sizes, in all areas, in all sectors. This is a very stable government policy that has been since the 70s. The fifth one for me is leveraging our journey of innovation for collaboration on a global basis for creating a new reality, a new tomorrow for us and other nations in the region. In order to innovate, you need to tap into new kinds of intelligence. We all know that IQ is important. So to innovate, you need to be intelligent. We all know that emotional intelligence is also very important, especially for leaders. I think that we need to tap into a third kind of intelligence. I call this um, your network intelligence, NQ. So when you have a big challenge, you go to your IQ, your EQ, but also to the power of people, because at the end, we are smarter than me. Israel has a mandatory army service. Most of the people today in the army go to the intelligence unit and create knowledge and innovation during their army service, so very easy to adapt it then to civilian life. Uh, so this is one component. We have very good universities. We have eight research universities in Israel, and they also are very well connected to the local ecosystem and to the local innovators and entrepreneurs. So there is also the knowledge coming from universities. 
We have um, multinational companies that are substantial part of this ecosystem. And we have today also a lot of startups and growth companies in Israel. Today we see many Israeli startups that have developed into larger companies, into big companies and even unicorns. And one very important component also is the venture capital industry. Israel today is one of the leading uh, venture capital sites in the world. Science and technology are amongst Israel's most developed sectors. The country has spent 4.3% of its GDP on urban research and development, the highest ratio in the world. It's the home to major companies in the high-tech industry and has one of the world's most technologically literate populations. In the seven decades of its existence, Israel attributes to this investment some of its leading innovations and exports to the world not only technologies but also also leading technological human capital. Nerafim started over 55 uh, years ago in the south of Israel, in a kibbutz called uh, Chatzerim. Um, it started, we say that most innovation uh, starts from a necessity, so it started out of necessity. Uh, Kibbutz Chatzarim wanted to start growing crops in the desert. This is a highly, highly arid uh, area. High temperatures, saline soils, very difficult to grow crops in that uh, region. And uh, they uh, joined, with, teamed up with a person by the name of Simcha Blas. And together they developed what is now called drip irrigation. Uh, and were able to start growing crops and achieve yields and quality that was not possible uh, prior to that. And when they understood that they had a product, they started looking how to expand initially inside Israel. Nedafim was established in 1965 in Negav, the desert area of Israel. Today, 4,300 people work in its 29 subsidiaries and 19 manufacturing plants spread across 110 countries worldwide. Thus far, Nedafim has irrigated over 10 million hectares of land and produced over 150 billion drippers for more than 2 million farmers. The innovation is about applying water to the uh, root and not to the soil. Uh, thus enabling the plant to uh, uh, consume water and fertilizers at the right time, at the right quantity, in a very efficient manner, without losing a lot to evaporation, to uh, drainage, etc. Um, and this allows the plant to achieve much better yields, much better quality, and at the same time save a lot of water, a lot of fertilizers, and be much more efficient in uh, how we uh, do agriculture. And with time, we also uh, made it much more efficient, so able to uh, uh, be used with, in different soils, with different uh, water qualities, and in different uh, crops. And that, that, I think, is a big part of the innovation. How do you take something as simple as that and bring it to the level of accuracy, sophistication, uh, that, uh, that allows you to uh, achieve consistent results. So initially it was all about how do I grow in conditions where I couldn't grow before or how do I use as little water possible. And these days it uh, evolved to how do I uh, manage my system in the most efficient manner possible, how do I maximize my business objectives and also a lot, how do I do it in a sustainable manner? So sustainability is a big part of the overall thing of how, how we manage the irrigation system, how we manage uh, agriculture in general. Uh, these days, much of the innovation also goes to the high-tech side of things. So how do we measure the performance of the system? How do we measure the performance of the plant and adjust the irrigation scheduling and the fertigation scheduling accord accordingly? And, and how do we create an automated system that farmers can control uh, via their mobile phone or laptop or anything from a remote? And how do we also give them a de decision support systems so they make the most sophisticated, smart decisions at the right time to achieve the maximum results possible? 
In Israel, Netafim is a widely known name and has become synonymous to success. From a business point of view, Netafim has managed to take a simple idea and turn it into a business that rolls in billions of shekels. Not only that, but Netafim has also managed to turn the Israeli desert, which constitutes about half of the country's area, into agricultural land. From then onwards, the way to go global was short. So I think you can talk about uh, Netafim innovation without talking about Israeli innovation. So it all starts from the fact that we are an, a company that started in Israel and is still incorporated in Israel. And Israel is a, an innovation hub. We're a very small country with limited resources and we need to constantly innovate and come up with new uh, ideas in different segments. We're a company that started from uh, in Israel uh, we expanded to the world. If we don't innovate uh, constantly, we don't have the right to survive. And this is nurtured also by management, which put it as one of our strategic uh, pillars, and also by the uh, DNA of the people all the way to the field. They all know that we need to constantly look for new things. They all know that if they bring new ideas to the table, uh, these ideas will be looked at and considered very seriously. We constantly move forward and this starts from the beginning. I can give a few examples. Um, for example, when we uh, started going into Brazil and uh, working in the sugarcane industry, we uh, soon understood that uh, some of our solutions don't fit how they grow sugarcane. And we started looking for how can we adjust uh, our solutions and our technology to their circumstances. It took a, a few trials and a few years, and there were some failures as well as some success. And eventually we got to a system that's very, very efficient and can increase uh, sugarcane yields significantly, reduce water usage, and also fits the overall scheme of how they operate uh, the farm. Being part of the innovative ecosystem in Israel and a global leader in precision irrigation solutions for sustainable agriculture requires Netafim to constantly seek out new innovations. One of the biggest challenges that we have today is digital farming. Um, like any other industry, agriculture as well must uh, uh, be supported by uh, technology these days and the whole digital world in order to be able to achieve efficiencies um, in terms of uh, input utilization, labor, etc., etc., And we are investing significantly in building a digital farming platform. This is an experimental area where we try different growing techniques, varieties, and all kinds of trials that uh, help us implement some of the ideas that uh, come from the field. It's uh, like a new part. Oh. Here you can see a very unique combination. In the back we have the most sophisticated firm form of uh, agriculture, a glass greenhouse, as is used in the Northern Hemisphere. And here you have sugarcane, a crop that's uh, grown in many countries around the world. Uh, a lot of it, the most uh, significant country is Brazil. Here we also do some experiments in terms of how to implement drip irrigation and sugarcane cultivation. We are here actually trying to simulate all the uh, farmers uh, worldwide uh, trying to simulate all the irrigation system, supplying all the uh, accessories, all the interfaces, modules for irrigation, fertigation, and uh, any sensor activities uh, worldwide. One big uh, uh, thing that all companies will have to adapt uh, to is the fact that this is now a global world. So, um, and companies need to truly become multinational and need to work in different environments, different cultures in a seamless manner in order to uh, thrive in this world. back I, I was a general and then it was 2004 or 5 uh, I saw that people already shoot shoot rockets in Israel not 100 a day like today once in a while they shoot rockets and people start to get killed make me very uh, uh, annoyed ambitious that we cannot Israel, startup nation, no solution against rocket. In 2005, 
Brigadier General Daniel Gold, then head of Mafat, decided to launch the Iron Dome program that would include the system's research and a demonstration of its intercepting capabilities. At that time, the development of such a system was estimated to take around 20 years. In Israel, the startup nation, all the powers, uh, we, we, can, we can tackle this. Both, by the way, in uh, intelligence, so I created a team. Uh, we analyzed about 24 or 5, 24 ideas. And we applied the, the industry around the world, our people. We get the idea, we, I ruled them all out. Nothing would have, work, have been working. And then we combine, we create, we architect the, the concept by ourselves here. And then I didn't want to do the regular R&D process. Regular R&D process, you said, okay, this is the idea. We have to have to develop many, many technologies. It's not application in iPhone. It's many, many technologies from electronics, chemistry, engine, uh, explosive, AI, many. Prove that they work and then you try to build it one by one. Then you inject the big money and develop the system, POC. I said, no, we don't have time. We do all in one pass. It was huge risk. So I was there doing R&D, but we have to have authorization and money to do it. Industry, after that, we pick the industry. So I went up, directly up, to the managers of uh, Defense Forces, Ministry of Defense in Israel, and they said no, no authorization. So what I, I, I do, I'll get up to the room of the last now, I said to my people, okay, we heard them all. I was part of the system. I said, tomorrow we start to do it. I don't know how. In 2007, Two years after Brigadier General Goad had started the research for the system, Israel commissioned the development of the Iron Dome, choosing Israeli contractor Raphael. I set the timeline for three years, three and a half, three years. This is the timeline for, for finish the business. It was also a breakthrough. Normally it takes 20 years. We finish it uh, one over 10 of the price and top performances. We change the rules of project management. Iron Dome, a mobile all-weather air defense system, was declared operational and first deployed in March 27, 2011. Ten days later, the system successfully intercepted a BM-21 Grad, launched from Gaza for the first time. By late October 2014, the Iron Dome system had intercepted over 1,200 rockets. The typical air defense missile battery consists of a radar unit, missile control unit, and several launchers, all located at the same site. Iron Dome can, before it shoots, it can calculate where the enemy missile is going to fall. So if it's going to fall into the sea, we don't waste money, it's okay. If you want to the fall open, uh, open desert, we are not going to intercept automatically, okay? It's not, uh, if it's going to fall in the city, we intercept. In parallel, we give alert, siren, to the specific neighborhood when the missile is going to fall. So the, let us say Tel Aviv, they're going to fall in the, I don't know, uh, east of Tel Aviv. East of Tel Aviv, we get an alarm. Iron Dome is still working. The rest of Tel Aviv can go to work. Iron Dome is part of a multi-tiered missile defense system developed to protect the country from threats ranging from mortars to ICBMs. The system includes Arrow 2, Arrow 3, Iron Beam, Barak 8, and David's Sling. Most of these projects are led by the same original team. The team of Iron Dome is very special. We pick 400 uh, men and women, all, all of Israel, the cream of the cream, the number one, from technology point of view and from personality point of view, because they have to work three years in a row with a lot of uh, objection, create, invent, innovate, and work with each other and create a system. So a special team, still, by the way, the team is working till today in this space, it's a very special team. So I think it's very unique, but not only to Iron Dome. Other projects or innovator in Defense Forces, in my organization, in a Defense uh, uh, Establishment, they work together as a team to a cause, they are big cause, big team, so they know to create the ecosystem, the friendship, to support each other, to create together, brainstorm together to reach the, to reach the target. When, when you go out, of course, it implicates all the ecosystem in Israel. We went to Alaska Kodiak, together with US, take our own infrastructure, all our industry, all this present there. We do the, everything in my organization. We hire this Russian huge aircraft, Antonov. We bring all the equipment of labs, very nice island, small population, very small population. Uh, and, and we took all the, all, all the equipment, 
We build hotel, no, no hotels, there are only one hotel, very small. We build hotels out of containers. As the battlefield of the future relies on technology for the war to be won, armies around the world train their soldiers in operating advanced systems. In Israel, there is a mandatory military service at the age of 18, and some of the soldiers are taking part in the development of some of those systems, thus turning the IDF Israeli Defense Force into a major player in the innovation ecosystem. Everybody, almost everybody is going to the army, the defense forces. They get a lot of responsibility when you are young and they take a lot of risk. Whether in technology, you have to invent technology, create technology to be creative, or either activate a system that very, very complicated and you have freedom to make mistakes and correct to get to the goal. It's a very good training mechanism, both from a psychology point of view and a technical point of view. When you are living in uncertain environment, your creativity is much better. The commercial world and the defense world leverage each other, give each other, uh, which is very complicated to do, but we have, we have started to do it in Israel with successes. We use, of course, defense company, uh, or big companies, but also we use uh, the startup scene in Israel. We use hundreds of startups that work with us on dual use uh, uh, innovation, things that are good for uh, defense or security, and things that are going to the commercial world, like, swarm of drone that uh, control the traffic in uh, Tel Aviv with uh, one of the transportation company. We can use the same infrastructure from swarm of drones. That, so this cooperation scene, in addition to international cooperation, we cooperate with good partners in creating the technology. US is the famous one, of course, with missile defense organization, but we have many more to create together the technology, to share the resources, share the innovation. So it's all about this. Uh, open your mind to cooperation. It was in March 2021 that the medical world was presented with a significant discovery in the treatment of glioblastoma, a highly evasive type of brain cancer exhibiting poor prognosis using a 3D printer. This major discovery came from Tel Aviv University in Israel and enables new and improved treatments for terminal glioblastoma. We used the technology of 3D printing in order to create a tumor with its all microenvironment, meaning with the blood vessels, with the immune system, everything around it that usually tumors recruit in order to be able to grow in size and diffuse. We recreated that whole ecosystem in order to mimic better the tumor the way it is when it is inside the brain of a patient. By doing so, we were able to find new targets for, for new drugs or for existing drugs for repurposing them to a new uh, target like glioblastoma, like this very aggressive tumor which has only three currently available uh, drugs for it. And the, the other side is to try different kind of uh, drugs that are either for that tumor or other uh, cancer types and test and see which one is the best fit. Professor Ronit Sachi Fainaro of the Sackler Faculty of Medicine, lecturer at the Sagal School of Neuroscience, and the director of the Morris Khan 3D Bioprinting for Cancer Research Initiative at Tel Aviv University, was a lead researcher in a team that made discovery. The novelty in our research is that we managed to create a 3D bioprinting tumor model by using two types of bio inks. One creates the blood vessels while the other creates the tumor tissue. The technology that we have created here will uh, allow us to have a rapid, robust, reproducible platform to develop new drugs, to test existing drugs and to fit them to, in a personalized manner to a specific patient. Combining the, the understanding that we can use data science, meaning all the big data that is uh, available now freely 
on, on the web. You just click on the internet, you, you ask for a gene or you ask for a question like, which genes are upregulated in glioblastoma? And it gives you an answer of 10,000 patients. We could have never had that before. We would get 50 patients and that would be a lot from, uh, from one hospital. And, uh, and that, that is a game changer. I think technology, data, machine learning, AI, all these tools that served the high tech so well throughout the last decades, these are extremely crucial tools for bringing more health, making health more accessible, creating a faster track for research. The way we see it is that it will revolutionize the way we diagnose, prevent and treat cancer. The way to validate this platform will be to test it in an open label trial, meaning that until now, we always did clinical trials without knowing who the patient is. So we cannot allow for follow-up. The new clinical trial will be open label. So we are getting a sample from the surgery room. We're creating our 100 mini tumors. We're testing on them several drugs. In two weeks, we know which drug is the best. As the world progresses, more and more digitalization is going to go into medical records. And then you can benefit from things that other countries have learned and applied on your data. Think about this. In one country, one physician is going to notice that a drug has a completely different effect on their patient. And maybe they found a drug that's going to affect Parkinson that's been used for something completely else. All of this information is going to immediately propagate to all of the world that's going to be connected. But for this, we need to make sure that all of our medical records are digitalized and shared globally so we can share this information, so we can find new discoveries this time together. $10.5 trillion are the global market for healthcare. Only $150 billion are the global market for cyber IT. So people who are looking to impact and people who are looking also to be entering a, uh, an industry that would assure that they can really develop their skills, their, t their, their um, talent, their impact along the years, feel much more comfortable entering the healthcare uh, ecosystem. The COVID-19 pandemic has had a profound worldwide impact as some scientific and clinical trials were temporarily put aside. The world medical community cannot, however, ignore the great benefits of huge advancement in using RNA therapeutics and peptide-based therapeutics. I've been researching nanoparticles for the last 20 years for cancer and for infectious diseases, but the, the advancement that we got in the last year and a half was because there was this urgent medical need of a global pandemic. At the moment, uh, being in this crisis, we all collaborated in a fantastic manner. It's something that we have not seen before. We are all very happy to collaborate. We saw that during this pandemic, every little thing that we just published as a post on Twitter or on Facebook or, or, or LinkedIn or whatever, just went and asked in the email, uh, is, is there anyone that has this antibody or this compound or another? And immediately we got 10 answers in the same day. This is something we have not seen before. So for sure the, the process of going through a major uh, crisis build collaboration and bridges, I see it as a trivial thing. The, the surprising effect will be if we see that we keep the memory of it and we continue working in that manner. As the saying goes, prophecy has been given to fools, and in today's world, even more so. So even though we don't know what the future holds, we do know that the technological revolution train has left the station. So where are we heading? So I think we should look at a lot of the high-tech companies today as we look at the governments. So this was a very nice idea shared by uh, the late president, Shimon Peres. He was saying that the new governments are going to be different they're going to be high-tech companies because they're global. And we're going to create a completely new way of creating politics. I think Israel is already one step forward to becoming not Israel, 
the physical nation. It's Israel, the digital nation with all of the companies and ecosystem that it has internally. And the impact is different because of this. It's creating a completely new way of being, uh, of creating industry. I believe that innovation and collaboration will also bring peace. So the journey that you can imagine in Israel is really very unique. It's a nation that started with innovation and grew with innovation and will continue to flourish. And in many ways, it becomes a model for many countries that they need to leave the old world where you rely on natural resources, on the wealth of the land, and you have to rely on your brain power. When nations become innovation nations, they can grow side by side, not on the account of others. And so we are entering an era of collaboration and peace where we are together addressing global threats such as COVID-19, such as climate change, such as cyber threats, inequalities, and all the other challenges that humanity is going to deal with. I see the Israeli future in innovation very bright, but I see also the world's future in innovation bright. I think today there is, uh, we see in a change in many, many places putting innovation first. So if once you would look at uh, uh, natural resources, you would look at uh, things that you can dig out of the ground, today it's no more the case. People are looking in all over the world for innovation. The industry here is export-oriented. What does it mean? It means that people think global from day one. It means that we're very receptive to foreign entities and to global entities. It also manifests itself in the industry. We have more than 400 uh, multinational companies who set here shop, be it an R&D center, and in late years, open innovation outposts. In the future, Israel cannot stand alone. The whole world stands on the brink of a technological revolution that will fundamentally change the way we live, work, and relate to one another. And it even has a name, the Fourth Industrial Revolution 4.0 the one that is expected to be unlike anything the history of humankind has experienced before. If we look specifically at the industrial sector, then uh, like many other sectors in the past two years, the industrial players have faced huge challenges from broken global supply chains to, uh, to safety of workers, uh, to really taking care of the resiliency of the business. Number one, is the safety and well-being of the employees. So safety 4.0, that's uh, everybody's talking about that. Everybody is is, uh, is dealing with that because this is a huge challenge and important for every, every facility, right? The second is supply chain. The third thing is resiliency. The fourth topic is, you know, the, uh, the classic industry 4.0 technologies, be it optimization of operations, uh, be it robotics and automation, uh, which only accelerated during the past two years. And last but not least is the very, very important notion of sustainability. And sustainability is something that I think that all of us personally should be aware of. And I think that it's a responsibility of all of us. We are facing enormous challenges as humanity today on Earth. Global warming, extreme weather, human rights, uh, social gaps between those who have it all and those who don't, don't, don't have enough. In my eyes, the only problem to tackle these huge problems is with progress, science, innovation and technology. And it has to be done on a global basis. It's not a country thing. It's not a local industry thing. We should globally take innovation forces. I see in the next decade dramatic change in terms of responsibility, impact, uh, accountability, sustainability. The whole, the whole um, world of business is going to change. It's not going to be measured only by economic parameters. It's going to be measured by impact, by other KPIs. Um, and it will change the taste of stakeholders, shareholders, customers, employees, everyone. I feel that with it, uh, it's going to be uh, a decade of women. I think women are going to break through. Uh, they're going to take their place at the table, as um, should be for many, many years. So I think uh, uh, the presence of women in both research and entrepreneurship has grown significantly. 
And I think it's not about asking whether it's a man or women, but asking who and how can think uh, without categorizing and without uh, uh, changing the way they behave just because of different uh, fixations. And what we are trying to do in 8400 is to change the ego system into ecosystem. And with that, I think women are stronger. I hope that the next generation of researchers, we, we will see more female entrepreneurs, we'll see more female professors. At the moment, we are talking about 15% of female professors. So this needs to, to change urgently. I'm not speaking about CEOs, that it's only 2%. And, and the numbers are really low compared to the numbers that we see in, in other roles that are lower. We do not know yet how the fourth industrial revolution will occur, but one thing is clear, it will require the cooperation of all stakeholders in world policy, from the public and private sectors to academia and the general public. Looking into the future, I think that innovation will come more and more out of collaboration. So it could be collaboration within a country and collaboration with different countries. So I encourage decision makers to create the platforms that allow people to collaborate, to think together and inspire them to be creative. By inspiring people, you never know where the most amazing idea comes. And if you do that in a diverse crowd between geographies and countries, this is where I think you'll find most success. The relationship between us and the world, between us and companies or nations, should be warmed up. Let's do innovation affairs, not foreign affairs, because we cannot be foreigners. Now, innovation allows us not to be foreigners. I think that today Israel is a global player in, in innovation, and playing in the international arena is, is crucial not only for Israel, but generally speaking, today we tackle challenges that are in a global scale. And if we have many players working together, sharing knowledge, opening their systems, adopting innovation, this can really create a change. Humanity is doing a great job. We are big, yes, we, are, we have challenges. Don't be honest. Yes, we need to fix Earth. Yes, we need to fix the air. Yes, we need to fix water. Yes, we need to fix so many things. To fix those challenges is not by going back. There's no option to go back. If you want to fix those challenges, you need more innovation, more technology, more science, more uh, uh, creativity, and the next generation will do it even much better than us. What is best, individual creativity or collective creativity? Well, if you have Steve Jobs on your team, <laughs> please do use it. Um, personal genius is something that always happened and will always give value individuals with great creativity. I think that the power of the collective is something that we are now going back to after many years of mostly highlighting personal creativity. Let's imagine the future for a second, okay? We continue to develop in software and computers and environmental technologies and AI and robots and space exploration and medicine. As a result, we create abundance. We create infinite abundance. 